All right, let's uh, begin our Bible reading this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 15, as we, as we continue our study in verse 16. Paul says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. We've already talked about how that's the issue of the, the church, the body of Christ, and knowing how we ought to behave, not in a physical building. It says in verse 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now we've spent two weeks already, uh, not last week, but the two weeks prior to that, discussing this issue of the mystery of godliness. Godliness being the issue of godlikeness. And he says the mystery of godliness is this, that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So Paul lays out here a mystery, the mystery of godliness. We've already talked about the issue and the difference between prophecy and mystery. When we look at the issue of God being manifest in the flesh, that God was manifest in the flesh, we took time to look at the issue of prophecy that Christ was manifest in the flesh. Yes, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John chapter 1 clearly tells us that God the Son, who in eternity past was not flesh, became flesh and manifested Himself in the flesh. And He came and He, he made such statements such as, If you have known Me, you have known the Father. We, we knew God in the flesh through the Lord Jesus Christ. But we, I asked you the question, and we looked through prophecy, the verses from the prophetic scripture, and I asked you the question, was it a mystery that God would be flesh? And the answer to that question was no, it was not a mystery that God would be flesh. When we looked through those verses, we saw that it was prophesied that God himself, the Messiah, would come, he would be born, and he would be God in the flesh. The issue of the mystery of godliness and that God was manifest in the flesh is the issue of God being manifest in the believer today. Um, so we have the issue of uh, you know Galatians chapter two and verse number twenty, where uh, it, where Paul says uh, it is no longer I who live, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And so this is the this is the issue today, you know, in, in the body of Christ. This is this is part of the great spiritual truth that has been revealed to the Apostle Paul and has been given to us. That when you put your faith in what the, the gospel um, and today, and you put your faith in that, God changes you. There's a change. The moment you believe, there is a change. And the issue is no longer about you, but it's about Christ in you. So turn, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. That's the, this is the verse that we left off um, last time. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The issue of it not being you. Of it being Christ in you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says this in verse number 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And I think I mentioned to you last time, I, I, I'm just so struck, and maybe it's because we're studying through the book of Genesis, but I'm just so struck in how Paul states that. He says, for, the God, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Look, from the very beginning when there was no light, before anything ever was, no, ne'er ere, ere there was anything, God said, let there be light, and He made the light to shine out of the darkness. Now the God who can take something out of nothing, which is what all the atheists are looking for these days, something out of nothing, and they can't find it. The evolutionists trying to find a, a, the abiogenesis, trying to find a re, how life began. They can't find it. But God is the one who can take something from nothing, and so whatever Paul's getting ready to say here, I think Paul says this to display the power of God. All right. So regardless of what comes after this, I would be expecting something very powerful to be coming. Because Paul just said, hey, you remember that God who made the light to shine out of the darkness? He's going to be able to do whatever it is that Paul's getting ready to say. He says, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, 
But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Earthen vessels. So the issue here is, what are we today? We're vessels, right? Now what, uh, maybe I brought this up last time, maybe I didn't, I don't know. But what is the purpose of a vessel? Is it the purpose of a vessel to look beautiful on the outside? Is the purpose of the vessel to accomplish something in and of itself? The purpose of the vessel is to contain something, is it not? What's the value of a vessel? What goes inside of it, right? You have a piggy bank at home, that's a vessel. What's the value? The money that goes inside of it, right? Well, you have a vessel that carries water. You know, you go, to, you, know, you go down to the river, you get water in the vessel, back before we had running water. I mean, come to where I'm from in Kentucky, that wasn't too long ago. You go down and you get the water, you put it in the vessel, and you bring the vessel back and it stays in your house. That's the water you use the day to clean yourself, to drink from, and all the, the value was what was put in the vessel. And now Paul says, we have this treasure, what he just talked about, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure. It's a treasure, folks. We have it in earthen vessels. That's us. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body... That's the vessel that we have, right? We're always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice this. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest where? In our body. Where is Christ being made manifest today? God being manifest in the flesh. That's Christ being manifest in you. He says, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Look, that's amazing. That mystery of godliness is a wonderful truth. He, he sits there and he says, You know, that same, you know, you know you're, you're a sinner, right? You, you, sinful flesh, the problem of the flesh. You know, we're, we are miserable people in need of a Savior. And God comes along and says, despite the, 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 the miserable wretch that we are, God is able to take that vessel, and the same God that made the light to shine out of the darkness has the same power to change you and to put Himself in you and to make Himself manifest in you. And it's done through your mortal flesh so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of you. Nevertheless, not I, but Christ. That's the issue. That's the issue. So God is not impressed with the vessel. God is impressed with what He puts in the vessel. And that's Himself. He's making himself manifest today through the church, the body of Christ. That's a mystery. That's something that people, that's now being made known. That's something that is being revealed. And so, um, God's word, when we think about how is it that Christ is manifest in us, God's word manifests God, does it not? Christ came and he says, you know, if you, would have, if you have known me, you have known my Father. Christ in the flesh was making God manifest. Now, today, we don't have the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh, but what do we have? We have his word. And that word is manifest in the believer. And if the unbeliever, who doesn't read God's word, and doesn't have the Lord Jesus Christ walking around in the flesh today, manifesting himself, is going to see God manifest today, where is it going to be? It's going to be manifesting you. The unbeliever is going to see you. And he's going to see that word working through you by means of the Holy Spirit. You are putting the life of Christ on display today. In your mortal flesh. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Turn back one book and go to chapter 1. Just for a simple statement here. Just a very simple statement to prove a simple truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. 
Paul says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. And boy, did those Corinthians need grace, didn't they? <laughs> and so Paul thanked the, thanked the uh, grace of God which was given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Where was the testimony of Christ confirmed? It was confirmed in the Corinthians. It was confirmed in them. That grace of God is being made manifest in the believer today. Um, turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll get closer back to 1 Timothy. but We're talking about the mystery of godliness. And 2 Timothy talks about a counterfeit godliness. Now that's interesting. Because we know what godliness is. We, we know that the, that issue is the issue of being godlike. What is this counterfeit godliness? Let's look at the verse, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, keep going, Paul, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, isn't that wicked, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, look at this, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Now, what is that form of godliness? They're denying the power thereof. What is the power of godliness? What's the power source? What's the believer's power source? It's Christ living in us. It's God himself, right? So they're going to deny the source from which the power comes, God, but yet there is a form of God-likeness. How is that going to come then? It's going to, that's, that's right. It's going to come through religion. It's going to come from confidence in your own flesh. Putting on a form of godliness on the outside, but denying the power thereof. Who has the power to live Christ's life in you? Who has that power? You don't have the power to live Christ's life. It's like, get out of the way, put the scriptures in you, surrender yourself, let God's life live out through you, through His truth being manifest in you. It's not, what would Jesus do in trying to think in your own mind and living it out in your life, or saying, well, you know, if, uh, if I were to establish a rules of righteousness, I would have Mass three times a day, and I would do penance, and I would say this many Hail Marys, and, and this, that, and the other thing, right? I'd really clean out my outside, and I'd make myself, you know, prim and proper, and make sure everything... No. See, the issue there is having a confidence in the flesh. And when you have a confidence in the flesh, it appears right. It has an appearance of rightness. But it's not. And so... We don't walk by sight, right? We don't walk by appearance. What do we walk by? We walk by the power source. We walk, we walk by having the power of God working out through us. And so in order to accomplish true godliness, in the sense of God-likeness, if we're going to accomplish it, who is doing it? It's God himself, isn't it? Look, I mean, just... Just think about that real simply. If the issue of godliness is godlikeness, do you think you could accomplish godlikeness? Do you think you're good enough? I know I'm not. And so the issue of being godlikeness is not me saying, not me trying to achieve some level of greatness in and of my own strength, power, and mental fortitude. It's being conformed to the image of Christ. It's, it's dying in the flesh. It's, it's understanding that it's no longer I who live. It's not my life. It's Christ's life. It's me decreasing and Christ increasing. And so the issue is God has to do it himself, and the counterfeit godliness would be man trying to accomplish it, man doing it. And so true worship is God working out through us. And so... 
the, that, that counterfeit is, whether it's the believer or the unbeliever, mimicking that which they think will please God. And, and it, it produces, it, but it's, it's, it's that whole issue, you know, it's, it's not doing it God's way. God says, here's the revelation, here's what I've revealed to you, here's my will. And man says, you know what, I think God will like this better. <laughs> and man goes about to do it his own self. Now whether man says, you know, maybe God would like this better, or maybe it's man just saying, you know what, I would like this better. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, it seems to me that God should be happy with this. Right? I mean, from the very beginning, man had two choices. You had God's way, you had the tree of life, and you had man's way, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And man says, you know what, God, you may have said, don't partake of this tree, but I'll do it my way. And ever since then, the issue has been God's way or man's way. So the great deception is trying to undermine what would produce genuine godliness, genuine God-likeness, and to undermine the sound doctrine working in the believer's life. Now, don't you think that the enemy would have a stake in trying to accomplish that? Trying to undermine the thing that actually works today? And they do it by trying to produce righteousness in our own flesh by our own works. So it's, not, it's, it's the opposite of Galatians 2.20. It's I who live. It's me who's doing it. And uh, that's, that's serving God in the flesh. Turn back to, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. So he says, um, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. So what does it mean that uh, we've already, I think, covered uh, the, the, the issue of God being manifest in the flesh? What does it mean that he was justified in the spirit? Who's that talking about? What does that mean? In, in, this, in this revelation of the mystery of godliness, how is it that God is manifest in the flesh? And how is it that God is going about manifesting some things? And part of it has to do with being justified in the Spirit. And the issue of justification means to declare it to be right or to reckon it to be so. You're acknowledging the truth of the fact declaring it to be right. I want to show you an example of it from Scripture that, um, to me, look, turn back to Luke chapter 7. Sometimes when you think about those terms that deal with salvation and uh, justification and things of that nature, sometimes we maybe conflate the words. And by conflate, I just mean we maybe blend the definitions a bit. And it'd be really good if somebody would write a book about the terms around salvation and the gospel. Um, so if someone could get to that, that'd be great. Pastor Tom wrote a book that deals with those issues, and you can get a copy out there. And you'll see, we'll get to a bit, an excerpt from, from his book on the issue of justification. But I want to show you this, this definition here. Look at Luke chapter 7, and look over at verse number 28. It says, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God, being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized of him. So that whole issue of justification there, does that mean that we're going to make somebody right? Does God need to be justified? God doesn't need to be justified. What does it mean that they justified God? Well, what it means there is that the people who heard him, they reckoned what God said to be true. They declared it to be right, and they went and got water baptized, that's the baptism of John, in order to declare it to be right. So God is righteous, and these people are declaring what God had communicated to them at that time through the Lord Jesus Christ and His earthly ministry. They're declaring that to be right, 
and they reconciled it, reckon, uh, reckoned it to be so. Notice there that the Pharisees and the lawyers, they rejected it. They did not justify God. They, they didn't reckon it to be so. They rejected that counsel. And so now, with, with that understanding of what justification is, declaring it to be right, so here you have the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And Paul goes through and talks about these things in the justification of, of uh, I'm sorry, in the details of the mystery of godliness. Let me read them for you again. Manifest, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So, with that understanding, what is it that's being justified? Well, when we look at the issue of justification, and I'm referencing now from the dictionary of the gospel, when Tom put these things together, you see that God is the source. So, if, turn over to Romans. We'll, we'll run through, we'll run a few verses through Romans here. Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> when it comes to declaring something to be right, reckoning it to be so, Romans chapter 8, we're going to see that God is the source. Romans 8.33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? If you're saved today, you're one of the elect. The elect is not some mythical group of nebulous believers that have been predestined from the foundation of the world that only certain individuals God would save and you have no idea who's the saved and who's the not. The elect are those who are put their faith in the gospel and now they're part of the body of Christ and God had predestined that body of Christ to, for His specific purpose and to be saved, to receive salvation. He says, it is God that justifieth. Who's going to lay anything to, the, to your charge. Nobody can, because it's God who justifies you. It is God who reckons it to be so. Nobody can contradict that. And so he goes on, Romans 5, 9. We have, so God is the one who justifies. He's the source of the justification. The basis is Romans 5, 9. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. You know, what is that? You put the blood on the doorpost and you have the Passover. We're saved through the blood because the blood is the basis. The blood is declaring it to be right. We have the righteousness of the blood who is justifying us. Romans 3.24 Romans 3.24, grace is the means. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Who, the, the, the grace of God declares it to be so. It, it is the means by which we're saved is God's grace. right? So you could have God justifying us and Him justifying us if He chose through our own works. But that's not what God uses, does He? He uses His grace. And so it is grace. We're justified freely by His grace. Go back to Romans 5.1. Faith is the appropriation. Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you declare it to be so? How is it declared to be so? Well, you have to put your faith in the gospel. And so, therefore, there's a justification by faith, and we're kept by the faith of Christ. And the last one, look at Romans 4.25. So just uh, back one verse. The resurrection is the guarantee. Romans 4.25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So the Lord Jesus Christ was delivered for our offenses. He was hung on a tree, and then He was buried because He died. Well, how is it that we can declare it to be right that we'll have eternal life? Because it says 
that he was raised again for our justification. Because the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the grave, there's a testimony that we can declare it to be right and declare it to be so that we too shall inherit the eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a justification there. And once you trust the gospel, you have been declared right because your sin is no longer imputed to you. So we can, there's a justification, the means and the, and the process by which it's all done. But turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I want to add one that's in relation to the mystery of godliness. And what I would like to add is that we are justified by the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse number 11 says this, And such were some of you. That's your previous state. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So you notice there were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So now with that in mind, I want you to think carefully about what 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16 says. That we are justified in the Spirit. Or I gotta watch how I say that. Not that what is what is the justification in the Spirit? So if we remember what justification means, that we're declaring it to be right, how does that relate to the mystery of godliness? And so I pose this question to you here. When it relates to the mystery of godliness, and I'll move the podium out of the way in case it's blocking your view, who is declaring whom to be right? What is being declared right in the spirit in the mystery of godliness? Is it man declaring man to be right? Is it man declaring God to be right? Is it God declaring man to be right? Or is it God declaring God to be right? You have four choices. Choose wisely. <laughs> well, the issue here is the whole issue of being justified in the Spirit is, first of all, it's not man. It's God doing it. It's justified in the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God declaring what God is doing to be right. The justification of the Spirit. You remember uh, over in, in the Gospels, in the book of John, he says, Christ says, if I bear witness of myself, my testimony is not, my witness is not true. Because the issue is that the, uh, the establishment of a fact is determined by two or more witnesses. And so how many people do you have in the Godhead? One, two, three, right? So the Spirit is declaring something that God is doing to be right. Um, it's not the Son justifying the Son, nor is it the Father justifying the Father. The mystery of godliness is that God was manifest in the flesh and God was justified in the Spirit. He was justified in the Spirit. The Spirit of God was justifying what God was declaring to be true. The mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh, that God was justified in the Spirit. Turn over to Romans chapter 16. So what is it that God was declaring that the Spirit is justifying? The Spirit was justifying that God was manifest in the flesh. The Spirit was reckoning it to be so. Romans chapter 16 and this preaching that's being done, what preaching is preaching this mystery of godliness? Romans chapter 16, verse number 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. 
Now we talked to you, uh, um, I talked to you a couple of weeks ago about the issue of, the issue of mystery. is not some mystical thing that you can't know. The issue of the mystery is that it has now been revealed and it is now being made known. It's not something that, you know, mystical where you think, oh, I just wish I could find the Father's will and you're groping around in the dark. God's giving you His Word and He's revealed it to you. Now get in the book. That book is a crazy book, man. It'll take you to places that you would have never dreamed. It has power. And uh, so the preaching by which is being justified here, the preaching that the Spirit is justifying, is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations by the, for the obedience of faith. It's now being made known to all nations. Go back to Romans 15. Look at verse number 15 of Romans 15. It says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. The Holy, the, the Holy Spirit has a ministry today. If you look back in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, uh, hold your place there. Uh, well, we'll, well, we're going to run a few more references. But in, in verse number 16 there in 1 Timothy 3, it says, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Now notice what he says. It says he was seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. When was he preached unto Gentiles? It wasn't until the revelation of the mystery was given to Paul that we have the preaching unto the Gentiles. So what ministry is being justified here? What ministry is being declared to be right and declared to be so by the ministry of the Holy Spirit? It's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And that includes Paul taking this gospel of salvation to the Gentiles. Look back at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. That's poor timing. That will not do. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse number 14. He was preached unto Gentiles, right? Seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles. Ephesians 2, 14. For he is our peace, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, who hath made both one, there's Jew and Gentile, into one body, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. There's that covenant of circumcision and the covenant of law that was a middle wall of partition between the Jew and between the Gentile in time past, through which you could not enter unless you would enter into Israel's covenant. But now that middle wall has been torn down. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, he abolished it in his flesh by his flesh hanging on a tree. And he says, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off. Here's the preaching of the Gentiles, preaching unto the Gentiles from 1 Timothy 3.16. He's coming and he's preaching peace to them that which were afar off, and to them that are nigh, for through him we both have access by one Spirit, Unto the Father, we have access by the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is justifying what it is that God is doing today in the dispensation of grace through the mystery of godliness. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So he says there that here's the preaching that Paul is doing. And it's, now it's being preached unto the Gentiles. And what is, what is going on here, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, is being preached unto Gentiles, is being made known. Not only that, but when we believe, what is it, what is it that we're sealed by? We're sealed with the Holy Spirit, right? So there's another testimony to the fact that we're sealed, and there's a testimony of the Spirit. So... This body of information is this revelation of the mystery committed unto Paul. 
This body of information is what the Spirit is justifying today, declaring it to be so. You know, the Spirit gives life. That's the ministry of the Spirit. The Spirit gives life. And in its ministry, it's declaring what God is doing today to be right. There's a testimony to its rightness. Paul receives a special revelation, takes it to the Gentiles, and when he preaches Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, God is manifest in the believer. And the Holy Spirit justified that message given to Paul. The Holy Spirit confirms God's message through Paul to be true. The Holy Spirit is justifying the fact that God was right in his revelation when he says, He would save me, come live within me, impute his righteousness to me, if I would but believe and put my faith in him. That encapsulates the ministry of the Holy Spirit today in the dispensation of grace. This is what the Holy Spirit is doing, declaring God to be so, declaring God to be right, declaring the, 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 the ministry of the Apostle Paul, which, is now commit, which was committed unto him and is committed unto us as ambassadors to be right, to be true, to be so. So those other people out there that have the form of godliness, what's justifying them? God's not in that. The Holy Spirit's not justifying that form of godliness because it doesn't have the power thereof. God the Holy Spirit is backing up what God the Father and God the Son, what God the Son has done, what God the Father is doing, and God the Holy Spirit is testifying of the fact that it's so. And you have that power in your earthen vessels. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this time in your word. We're thankful for the power of it and, and the power, your power and what you've done in us. Thank you for your Son who's given us these blessings freely. In Christ's name, amen.